Good evening, everybody. My name is Dr. Dennis Goodman. I am a clinical professor at NYU in the, in the Department of Cardiology and part of the Preventative Cardiology Department. I'm the Director of Integrative Medicine at NYU, and I'm the founder of this lecture series with Anya and Julia, and we're very proud of this lecture series, and I want to thank all of you who attend regularly and join this program. We have a very special program tonight, which I will be introducing very shortly. Next slide, Anya. Next slide. So one important thing for you to know is that if you want to ask a question, I'm sure many of you are used to Zoom now in these very, very challenging, stressful times, and you go to the Q&A, not the chat box, but the Q&A, I already have several questions that were emailed to us. We're going to take some of those questions. And if you have a question, please go to the Q&A box, write in your question, and I will do my best to ask as many questions as I can. Next slide. So this is our website, and uh, you can see what's coming up. Please register online so we can tell you what's coming up. The next program is called Seasonal Nutrition Eating Patterns, Wednesday, March the 31st, same time. And then we have another program, Preventing Heart Attacks and Strokes, using uh, uh, tips for adopting healthy lifestyle using mobile tools and information technology. So that's April 28th. Next slide. Here's our website, here's our email, we're on Twitter, and we are very active on social media. So please, if you enjoy our programs, let people know about it because we are trying our very best to reach out to as many people as possible because we all believe in prevention. And the most important thing you can do to treat heart attacks and strokes and chronic diseases is to prevent it. And we have all the ways in which you do so at this lecture series. Next slide. So these are some of the past topics. You can see we've had over 50 programs now, update on diabetes, obesity, hormone therapy for men and women, nutrition and cardiovascular health. And I am keep updating the topic. So if there's anything you'd like to hear about, please let us know. Next slide. So I'm about to introduce our speaker, but just before I do that, I wanna just say thank you to Anya and to Michelle from Communications. Without them, this program wouldn't exist. Anya is an absolute rock star. I really appreciate everything she does. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Jeff Berger, who's the head of our prevention program, and Dr. Ed Fisher. Uh, before him, they've been incredibly supportive of this program, and we're all very, very proud of it. Tonight is very, very special for me, um, and I am so delighted Dr. Harmony Reynolds, that you've agreed to speak to for us. This is American Heart Month, February. And so it was very special that we managed to get you during this month. Dr. Harmony Reynolds is an Associate Professor of Medicine at NYU School of Medicine, where she serves as Director of the Sarah Rossata Center for Women's Cardiovascular Research and Associate Director of the Cardiovascular Clinical Research Center. Dr. Reynolds' research career has been focused on mechanisms and outcomes of cardiovascular disease in women and testing treatment strategies for ischemic heart disease in clinical trials. She's particularly well known for her work in heart attack and chest pain with open arteries. That's very important to understand. Most of the time when someone has a heart attack, we go in and we find out the arteries blocked. Well, in this particular situation, the arteries are open and that creates a situation of tremendous difficulty understanding it. And Dr. Reynolds is an expert in this area, and she's going to be talking about that. She has received funding from the American Heart Association and the National Institutes of Health to study heart disease in women and the best diagnostic and treatment pathways for patients with heart disease. Her research has been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and on the major television networks. Her clinical efforts include general cardiology practice with a focus on cardiovascular disease in women and supervision of fellows in the Bellevue Cardiology Clinic. She's committed to education of medical students, residents, and cardiology fellows, and has mentored over 30 trainees in research. She's received her medical degree from the New York School of Medicine and completed her training in internal medicine and cardiology at NYU and Bellevue Hospital. Dr. Reynolds is board certified internist and cardiologist and a fellow of the American College of Cardiology, the American Heart Association, the American College of Physicians, and the American Society of Echocardiography. 
She's been recognized for research and community work as an American Heart Association Go Red for Women Luminary and with the AHA Young Hearts Award for Achievement in Cardiovascular Science and Medicine and the AHA Jane Chestnut and Nisha Goldberg Research Award. Dr. Reynolds has been named an American Heart Association rock star of science. She's also a rock star at NYU. She's a colleague of mine. I'm very proud to be at NYU with her. And I also want to say that she's a volunteer for the American Heart Association, does so much work for so many, and it's a real delight to have you. I'm handing over to you, and we'll take some questions at the end. Harmony, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's a real privilege. Thank you so much, Dr. Goodman, for that very warm introduction. Let me get right into it. Can you see my screen? Yes. Lovely. Okay, so uh, this is the Women's Heart Health Update, and we're going to focus on heart attack in women. So this session will cover statistics you should know. Heart attack in women, all about it. Symptoms, mechanisms, diagnostic testing, what makes women different, and what to do if you or someone else might be having a heart attack. We'll talk about research related to stress levels and platelet activity, and certainly about cardiovascular disease prevention. So let's start with the stats. Cardiovascular disease is the leading killer of women, and also men, and that's true in every race and ethnic group. On this graph, you can see women on the left and men on the right. Heart disease is the leading killer, and stroke is down here as number four. So if we put those together, since prevention is similar, you can see that they far and away outstrip other causes of death. We've talked for a while about heart disease death rate trends in men and women. And for about 20 years, we were making a lot about this gap because women were dying in higher numbers from cardiovascular disease than men. So the good news in these most recent curves is that we've closed that gap. But the bad news is that for both men and women, cardiovascular disease death is on the rise. We need to stop this. Unfortunately, women don't necessarily know that heart disease is the leading cause of death. And so every few years, the American Heart Association asks a group of women at random, what is the leading cause of death for women? And you can see that in 2009, in these white bars, the majority, a scant majority of women recognized that heart disease and heart attack were the leading threat. But fast forward 10 years and we've lost a lot of ground. Fewer than half of women can recognize that heart disease is their leading health threat. And the, the trends are even worse when we look at Black, Hispanic, and Asian women, and really bad in young women. So we've lost a lot of ground in the 25 to 34-year-old age group. So I am challenging all of you today. Thank you for being part of this session. You, by virtue of gaining this information, have become a champion for women's heart health. And I'm relying on you. You know women of racial and ethnic minorities. You know young women. And the AHA knows that young and minority women are often misinformed. So I need you to spread the wealth of knowledge here so that everyone can have this important information. All right, let's get into it. Heart attack in women. The scientific term is myocardial infarction, often abbreviated MI. There are 335,000 of these per year in the United States in women. And this is remaining a major cause of disability and death. There are many important differences between the sexes in heart attack, and we're going to learn quite a lot about that tonight. What is a heart attack? It's really interruption of oxygen and nutrients to the heart muscle that leads to cell death. It's typically caused by blood clotting on cholesterol plaque in heart arteries. What if this happens to you or someone you know? What are you going to do? Early treatment works best for heart attack and stroke. I tend to talk very quickly. I'm a native New Yorker, so I want to say this again. Early treatment works best for heart attack and stroke. There's so much fear around heart attack and stroke, but if you get to care early, you're much less likely to have disability and you're much more likely to survive. Did I say it properly? You're much less likely to have disability. I hope I said that right. So how do we survive a heart attack? You don't wait more than five minutes for calling before calling for help, and the way to do it is to call 911, call EMS, get to a hospital right away. We have to learn the warning signs and I'm going to talk about those. But if you're not sure about your symptoms, what you do is you go to the hospital and let a doctor decide and you don't drive yourself because this is what happens if you're wrong, right? If you think that you're okay to drive yourself to the hospital, maybe you're right and if you're right, great. But if you're wrong, you don't just hurt yourself, you potentially hurt somebody else. So don't drive yourself. What are the symptoms? Some heart attacks are sudden and intense. 
but most of them start slowly with mild pain or discomfort and one or more of these symptoms, chest pain or discomfort. And people often ask me, you know, I had a chest pain. It lasted a minute. Do you think that was a heart attack? Probably not. If, uh, and definitely not. Heart symptoms have to go on for a period of time in order for them to be heart attack. I would expect the symptoms to go on for at least 15 or 20 minutes, or they may be coming and going. But when they start, you're not sure. And so if it's lasting more than five or 10 minutes, you need to call for help. Chest pain or discomfort that lasts more than a couple of minutes. It can be discomfort anywhere in the upper body, jaw, neck, shoulders, back, either arm, upper stomach area. There may be shortness of breath or just a sense that breathing is not right. That might be labored. There may be nausea, there may be vomiting, there could be sweating, there could be dizziness. And people have this idea that there would be a sense that something is wrong, that if they were having a heart attack, they'd know. The discomfort would have to be so bad that they couldn't stand it. But that is not always the way it works and you can't rely on it. There is in fact a Hollywood heart attack myth. If any of you have seen this movie, Something's Gotta Give, you know, here's this older man, he's with a young girl about to get intimate and he falls on the floor and he clutches his chest and he can't even speak, you know, it's very dramatic. But heart attacks don't always feel like that. They don't always feel like they look in the movies. Most people will have chest pain or discomfort, but not everybody has that. You may have only trouble breathing, only nausea or vomiting. There may only be just a sense that something is wrong. The discomfort might not even be that bad, but even if they recognize the symptoms, we know that women hesitate to call 911 and they get to the hospital later than men on average. And every minute counts when we're trying to save heart muscle. So we need to change that instinct among women. What do women know about heart attack symptoms? Well, you guys now know what heart attack symptoms are, but unfortunately the American Heart Association survey shows that only half of women know that chest pain is a typical symptom of heart attack. Less than half know that the pain could be in the shoulders, the neck, or the arms. And you see that the numbers just go down, 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 and knowledge is even worse and declining over time in women of racial and ethnic minorities and in younger women. There's this common misconception that women's heart attack symptoms are totally different than men's and that you just don't know what could be a heart attack in women. That's not exactly the case. Now it is true that if you look at these numbers from over a million women and men, with heart attack. These bars show you the proportion of patients, each sex in every age group, that didn't have chest pain. And by chest pain, I include any kind of a discomfort feeling in the chest. And you can see that as we get older, we're more likely not to have chest discomfort with a heart attack. And at every age group, women are a little less likely to have chest pain than men, a little more likely to present in these bars with no chest pain. But most people have chest pain even if it's just a discomfort. So that difference between the sexes is actually not as strong as people used to believe. If most women have chest discomfort with heart attack, why is the diagnosis missed more often in women? And this is clearly the case. Recent research shows that women describe symptoms in a less uniform way. We're all our own unicorn. So I may describe something a little bit different than you may describe something a little bit different than somebody else does. And doctors rely on pattern recognition and they tend to lock in when they hear chest pain. But very often I find that women are downplaying their symptoms, they're offering alternate explanations or they're apologizing for bothering the doctor. This kind of behavior tends to influence doctors subconsciously, I don't think it's conscious, to discount the symptoms. So instead what I would like you or a friend to say if you needed medical attention for chest discomfort is, doctor, could this be a heart attack? Don't be afraid of the answer. Heart attack is treatable. Let's make sure we get the right diagnosis. This is from the American Heart Association's Don't Die of Doubt campaign. And I bring these up here because I hear these things all the time. It's still happening even among people who have attended sessions like these and know the symptoms. When it comes to themselves or a friend, sometimes they don't see it as clearly. Women often say, I would feel, feel foolish calling an ambulance. Why? What on earth is an ambulance for, if not for a possible heart attack? When there are false alarms in the emergency room, nobody minds, everybody's happy, including the patient. I didn't know driving myself to the emergency room would delay treatment. This is very important. When an ambulance comes, an EKG is done in the ambulance, and there are certain EKG findings that may trigger very rapid treatment. And that uh, system can be activated from the ambulance. But if you don't have an EKG until you arrive at the hospital, well, we've missed some opportunity there. Plus people who walk in are naturally thought to be a little better off than people who arrive by ambulance. So if your friend has possible symptoms of heart attack or stroke, you want to come in by ambulance. 
how will doctors decide if it was a heart attack? I said, let a doctor decide. That will often go down with the troponin blood test. This is a test that can find even tiny little amounts of heart damage, but it may not show up as abnormal until several hours after symptoms begin. So it's common for people to stay and get a second test, even if the first test is normal. Don't walk out after the first test. Many people with heart attack will have a normal EKG. And I put for myself, remember this paramedic, because one of my favorite patients was recently, she recently had a heart attack and her EKG was normal when the paramedics arrived. And the paramedic honestly said to her, you know, I think you're nervous. I think you're stressed out. Your EKG is fine. You're not having a heart attack. This was a young, healthy looking woman who was having a heart attack. Paramedic got it wrong. So please don't listen to that kind of person. If you're concerned enough to call 911, go to the hospital. Don't let them talk you out of it. Women, especially younger women, science shows are less likely to have troponin checked, even if they have cardiac sounding chest pain. You might need to ask for it. Be your own advocate. What standard diagnostic testing do we do for potential heart attack patients? A coronary angiogram, also known as a cardiac catheterization or a cath. In this test, you're given an IV in a local anesthetic and a tube is inserted through a blood vessel in the arm or the leg in order to reach the heart's blood vessels. And people lie on an x-ray table and an x-ray camera moves around to take pictures. If the arteries are blocked and most of the time with heart attack, they will be, then there's the ability to put in a balloon and a stent to stop the heart attack right there. What does that look like on an angiogram? It looks like this. So this is a picture of the heart. This tube coming up and around here is the catheter and the dark stuff is the x-ray contrast dye. This artery has some lumpy bumpy stuff and it comes around here and then there's this little branch that comes off, but it just stops. That stopped because there's a blood clot in that artery and the liquid can't pass through it. So we don't see the rest of the artery. Now, when I talk about early treatment, it's because with an angioplasty, a balloon and stent, you can see that whole artery come back. You can see that was a big artery that was completely blocked. So there's no time to sit there and deny it to somebody, deny it to yourself and say, hmm, this probably isn't a heart attack. We want that artery open as quickly as possible. So let's get into a real understanding of what typical heart attack is like. It starts with cholesterol plaque. And in these schematics, this is a normal artery. It has an artery lining in this sort of orange color, and then it has a muscle layer, and it has an outer bit of tissue to hold it all together. Oops, as time goes on, plaque can build up, and this cholesterol and inflammatory stuff goes into the wall of the artery. And you can see in the early stages, there's plenty of room for blood flow. It might not narrow the artery at all. The artery will expand to accommodate the stuff that doesn't belong there. In much later stages, the plaque may actually grow so big that it will block the artery. But what people don't always recognize is that it's these small plaques most of the time that cause heart attack. Five minutes before the heart attack happened, the plaque might have been very small. These small plaques can start to show up even in the late teens and 20s. Most of us in this meeting have them. Most heart attack will start here and many people have several small plaques. Not all small plaques are dangerous, but some are. And there's a whole huge amount of research being poured into trying to figure out which of these plaques is vulnerable and what to do about it. So if we know that we, many of us have plaque and we know that small plaques are often the ones that cause heart attack, what are we trying to fix here? For years, people understood that what we're looking at for artery blockage and for heart attack is, is a rusty pipe type of a thing. The artery gets progressively narrowed and that's when a heart attack happens. Now I've just shown you that's not the way it usually works. So that's the old model. The new model is, what do I do about this plaque? Doctor, can you make this plaque go away? We can't make it go away, but we can fix it on a microscopic level. The plaque that's not treated is a lot like a raw egg. It's got a bunch of gooey stuff inside and it's got a thin shell. It's fragile. And for reasons that we don't always understand, it may break. And as the blood is flowing on and touches that plaque, the blood may clot. And that's what causes heart attack. So what we need is not to make that plaque go away, We'd like to, but instead we need to change it on a microscopic level because this we can do. We can harden it and it's a lot like hard boiling an egg. So the plaque is completely different inside, it's a lot less fragile, and it shouldn't pose a problem. This is how medication and lifestyle changes work. With medication and lifestyle, we go from having a big pool of grease in the plaque with lots of inflammation and a thin cap over it to a smaller grease pool, less inflammation, and a thicker, safer cap over the plaque. Now let's talk about what makes heart attack different in women. There's a larger variety of causes of heart attack among women. Women get less testing and less treatment than men. 
women have worse outcomes than men. And especially if we match young women to young men with heart attack, the women have worse outcomes. Stress is more severe and it has worse effects in women with heart attack. So in general, with heart attack in women, there's more to think about. And that's just the way it is with a lot of things in women. I like this cartoon that shows the unspoken communication between two men. They say hi, they think hi. Two women have a conversation, they say hi, and there's all this other stuff going on. And that's kind of like what I have to do as a cardiologist treating a woman. I have to think not only about the most common causes, but the whole laundry list of everything else that it might be because less common heart attack types disproportionately affect women. One of them is coronary dissection. When this happens as a cause of heart attack, up to 90% of these are in women. This type of heart attack often affects younger women and they may have few or no heart disease risk factors. It's sometimes seen during or after pregnancy, a time when people are in their greatest period of health, but still chest discomfort after pregnancy may signal heart attack and warrant immediate attention. It's thought to start with bleeding into the artery wall. This causes narrowing, but it's not plaque. And we can see this on an angiogram. So here's another section showing you a normal artery with a nice thin wall. And if you look over here, we think that this uh, dissection starts as almost a bruise in the artery wall. Again, for reasons that we're not sure about. And as that bruise comes up, it can narrow the artery just like plaque can. It's just from a different reason. And sometimes that will even break through and cause a tear in the artery wall. What about heart attack with open arteries? When people have an angiogram and open arteries happen, they're sometimes told that wasn't a heart attack, but it often is. For decades, it's been recognized that angiography may identify no significantly diseased artery in some patients with MI. And then after the angiogram, the cause remains uncertain. The lay term I like to use for this is open artery heart attack, but the scientific term is myocardial infarction with non-obstructive coronary arteries or MINOCA. There are up to 150,000 of these per year in the United States, and it's more common in women at younger ages with Black or African race and with Hispanic ethnicity. This problem can be fatal. There's up to a 5% one-year death rate. Doctors have different amounts of knowledge about this problem. So when the arteries are open, patients can hear very different information depending more on the doctor than the patient. So Dr. A says, you had a heart attack. Dr. B says, great news, it's not a heart attack. And Dr. C says, I'm not sure. I need some more tests in order to sort it out. Dr. C is right. There's a whole laundry list of causes when the arteries are open. So some people have plaque, which is shown here, and it did break, it ruptured or had erosion, and then they have a blood clot that temporarily blocks the artery, or maybe that blood clot is small, but it travels down the artery and knocks off a little branch and knocks off some heart muscle. Some patients have coronary spasm. The arteries have a normal muscular lining, and in some people, that muscle can go almost into a cramp and it can temporarily narrow or even close the artery, causing heart attack. But by the time of the angiogram, it may have relaxed and there be maybe no trace on that angiogram that it happened. Coronary dissection occasionally shows up with open looking arteries. And some people have a coronary embolism. A blood clot may form in the artery and may travel through the artery. Sometimes this is triggered by hormones, including oral contraceptives. Some patients don't have heart attack at all. They have Takotsubo syndrome or myocarditis. So let's say a quick word about Takotsubo syndrome, also known as broken heart syndrome. This occurs in one to 2% of heart attacks. Up to 90% of the patients are female and they're usually postmenopausal. It may be triggered by extreme stress, whether it's anger, a sad stress, a happy stress, extreme exercise, or there may be no obvious trigger. It looks just like a heart attack, and, and some people will say it's a subtype of heart attack. The EKG will be abnormal, and there's quite an extensive area of heart muscle that is not functioning properly. The good news about this is that there's full recovery of heart function in survivors, but there is a lasting risk of heart disease and death down the line. And sometimes I worry about telling people about Takotsubo syndrome because they may think, oh, well, you know, I've been stressed out. I've been kind of upset. This is probably just broken heart syndrome. It'll all go away. You can't know that without coming to the hospital and having an angiogram. So uh, let's talk also about myocarditis. Myocarditis is not heart attack. It's an inflammatory problem or an infection. And it's really important to make that diagnosis because somebody may be told that you were having heart attack and in fact, there are the testing shows that patient didn't have a heart attack and none of the usual medicines are needed. And that's a good use of cardiac MRI. It's also important to recognize that each of these different causes may have an entirely different treatment. So we think it's important to get to the underlying cause. 
And for that reason, we have this American Heart Association funded research study called the Women's Heart Attack Research Program here at NYU. It uses images taken from inside the arteries with a technology called optical coherence tomography and magnetic resonance imaging, MRI of the heart, to show the reasons for heart attack in the individual. So in this patient, this angiogram has an artery that looks nice and wide open, looks very smooth, but the OCT shows us that there's a big blood clot in there. And the MRI shows us this white that's abnormal, that's an area of damage. And the OCT, oh dear, there we have a bunch of animated things. Okay, the OCT may show us things that look completely different. It may show us a plaque, a small plaque like this that has a tear in it. I think you guys can see where the arrowhead is, that there is a break in that plaque and the star shows us this goo that's inside the vessel. Some people have plaque erosion, it's kind of like a skinned knee on the artery that develops a blood clot. Here is an image from inside the artery of a coronary dissection. Some of the artery has been peeled away inside the center. And this is what a normal artery would look like. And we might see that, let's say, in somebody who had spasm and it went away. Cardiac MRI is really useful in differentiating different causes of heart attack. The black here is a normal heart and it's sort of looked at in cross sections, so it's supposed to look like a donut. This white part is an area of heart damage that we can tell is related to a blood vessel problem. We can't tell which blood vessel problem, but we know that that is heart damage from a blood vessel problem. Contrast that with this example in the center of myocarditis. You can see that these areas of white are much more patchy. They sort of skip and they spare the interior lining of the heart and because the arteries come from the outside in, we can know that that is not a blood vessel problem. Also, we know where the blood vessels go, and in myocarditis, typically, there are problems that go to different areas of heart muscle served by different arteries. Even if we don't see any signs of permanent damage, we may see some temporary signs of heart muscle swelling that can give us a signal about what happened. The earlier we do this test in somebody with heart attack and open arteries, the more information we may get. The results of our study that was American Heart Association funded showed that with these two tests, we could identify the reason for the heart attack presentation in 85% of the women. 64% of them had true heart attack. 20% had an alternate cause, wasn't a heart attack at all. Very different diagnoses. All right, let's turn our attention to stress and heart disease in women. High stress after a heart attack increases the risk of death two years later, so stress matters. And how does stress and heart disease work together in women? Well, women with heart disease report higher stress levels compared to men, and they tend to report different types of stress. For women, the most commonly reported areas for stress will be caregiving and conflict between work and family. We believe at NYU that tailoring of stress management interventions to women's needs is necessary, and my colleague Tanya Spruill is doing a stress management randomized trial in order to learn more about this. And she's shared with me this conceptual diagram that I think is really helpful in understanding why stress management can be so useful. Everybody has external stressors. There are chronic stressors in our lives, there are the daily hassles, and then there are the major life events. Sometimes you can't predict them. But that's different than the internal sense that you are overwhelmed and unable to cope. That's perceived stress. And it's that perceived stress that's associated with an increased risk of death after a heart attack because it has these consequences. It has emotional consequences like depression, behavioral consequences like poor sleep, and physiological consequences, including altered platelet activity that can predispose to blood clotting. And we think that it's the interplay of these things you see in orange that lead to the adverse outcomes among women. So we're testing mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. We have an eight-week group-based program that's under study, and I hope to have results for you soon. It uses mindfulness training, which is just a simple meditation practice helping people to develop awareness, acceptance, self-compassion, and non-judgment. The idea that you get out of automatic pilot, notice how you're feeling, and just that little noticing gives you enough distance to let the stress level come down. Cognitive therapy helps people identify and modify unhelpful thoughts and, uh, and beliefs. The idea that everything is a catastrophe. I certainly start to feel like every little thing in my life is a catastrophe, and we have to sort of downplay that and, and stop saying we must and we should. It's not an all or nothing way of being. We're human, we do the best we can. So that's the idea behind it. Early results from the study at baseline show some interesting findings. One of them is that resilience and stress are intimately linked and it makes a lot of sense, but it's nice to see it scientifically. Most of our women had high stress leading up to their heart attack and stress levels improved over time in those who were um, 
tested as having normal or high resilience features at baseline, but not in those who had low resilience. So one of the things we want to do is to cultivate resilience. So here are a few tips to manage stress in the moment. Recognize how you're feeling and try not to judge yourself. Everybody has an inner critic. The inner critic can be very mean. So say something positive to silence her. Now, it's not like we're going to pretend everything is rosy when things are bad, but we need to use third person language, right? So instead of I can't do this, it's there is a long to-do list for today. Not all of these things will get done. I will prioritize which things are most important. Try to just push it away a little bit. You've done hard things before. All of us have done hard things in our lives. When we're presented with a difficult situation, we will be able to get through it. Take a deep breath. Count to four on the way in really slowly. Count to six on the way out. If you do that three times, it's only 30 seconds. You have 30 seconds to calm your heart and your mind. Take a quick walk if you possibly can, or at least get up out of your chair. I think we all have Zoom fatigue, endless meetings in the chair, and so many expectations now that work is going to permeate every minute of one's life. Get up out of your chair, take a few minutes. If you can't even do that, at least look out the window. Try to notice what's there. Look out and notice what's there. Again, giving yourself a little bit of distance from the situation. Let's talk about platelets and heart attack. Platelets can be our friend and they can be our enemy. Platelets are blood cells whose whole function is to stop bleeding. And so they're running around in our blood all the time waiting for something that might happen. But increased platelet activity can result in heart attacks or strokes because we may have platelets that are just too active, too eager to get into the fray. And platelets also play a role in blood vessel health and inflammation and immunity. They interact with all different types of cells and that can regulate different processes. My colleague, Jeffrey Berger at NYU, you heard from Dr. Goodman, he's the head of the Prevention Center, uh, is studying heart attack in women and how platelets relate to that and relate to different types of heart attack in comparison with controls. So we will hopefully have results uh, for you on that very soon. But so far, some tantalizing evidence in these studies, Dr. Berger's laboratory took the blood, the circulating blood of women with heart attack and compared them to different types of heart attack on the right and Minoka versus control women on the left. And just to give you a sense, the red and the blue are different genes that are activated or being less activated. And you can see that there are really marked differences here. Just looking at the heat map, you can see a lot of differences. He learned that the most likely pathway to be affected and to be different in heart attack with open arteries versus either closed artery heart attack or controls related to estrogen receptor signaling. So that's so interesting because women are more likely to get Minoka. Maybe there is a sign there. And others were often related to inflammation than atherosclerosis. So again, a lot more uh, interesting research to come. And now in the remaining time, I want to spend a lot of time talking about heart disease prevention because ultimately this is probably the most important thing I will say to you. The American Heart Association has this very simple framework called Life Simple 7. There are heart disease risk factors we can't control. We can't control genetics, we can't control our age, but we can control these things. We can eat better, we can maintain a healthy weight, we can get active, we can not smoke, we can achieve a normal blood pressure, low cholesterol, and a normal blood sugar. So I'm gonna speak about each one of these. Eating better, we recommend now the Mediterranean diet. Here are some things that you can do to try and make a Mediterranean diet happen. You're going to want to make smart choices and swaps, and sometimes it's one step at a time. So if you're somebody who's ordering takeout three nights a week, then maybe you can either choose something healthier or hopefully cook one of those nights per week. That's one change, but it winds up being two healthy changes, right? Because you're taking away an unhealthy thing and you're giving yourself hopefully something healthier. So small increments, and if you look back after making a number of small changes, you wind up finding out that you're very in a very different place from where you started. So we want to enjoy vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, legumes, nuts, lentils, beans, chickpeas, uh, nuts, plant-based protein, lean animal protein, skinless poultry, and fish. And for me, shellfish counts as fish. We want to limit sweetened drinks. Don't drink your calories. It's sort of a waste. We want to limit sodium, especially if your blood pressure is high. Not everyone needs to limit sodium, but many do. Processed meats. Those are particularly bad. Bacon, sausage, deli meats. The processing seems to be bad for us. We want to avoid refined carbohydrates like added sugars and processed grain foods. Code here, cookies, cake. We want to avoid full fat dairy products, highly processed foods and tropical oils like coconut and palm. It really concerns me that coconut oil has become a bit of a fad. And there are people, I assume the makers of coconut oil who are advocating this as something that may be healthful 
when in fact it raises the bad cholesterol, it raises the LDL, and it's worse than butter in terms of how much saturated fat it has. We want to completely avoid trans fat. Read the label to show there are no partially hydrogenated oils because the rules are if there's less than half a gram, they can say it's trans fat free, but it's not. And even two grams of trans fat per day can be harmful. No margarine at all. I'd rather you eat butter. Not a lot of butter, but absolutely no margarine, please. Read nutrition labels, and I think this is most useful in looking at the portion size, because sometimes a food will really look like it's healthy, and then you figure out that the portion size is like one bite of that food, and the box is gigantic, and nobody would eat that little, in which case we might not want to eat that food. But when I give people diet advice, I really say it. Think about what you want to eat that's healthy instead of thinking about what you don't want to eat. If I think about not eating cookies, all I want is cookies. But if I think about eating healthy vegetables, then I want more vegetables. Olive oil is a health food, and it helps you feel full. We used to think that a low-fat diet was extremely important, but now we believe that it's the right fat. Right fat helps you. Treats are fine. We have to have treats in life. But if you look back and you say, well, I had, but I had a, treated myself to a bacon, egg, and cheese on this day, and I also treated myself to a sausage barbecue, and then I had cake, and then it was somebody's birthday, you know, you look back and you're eating something that's a treat every day. Don't do that. My opinion is that eggs are fine. Eggs can be controversial, and there are articles that come out. It's sort of like tuna fish. Every two years, they tell you, eat it, don't eat it. I believe that eggs are healthy. They have a lot of nutrients. And for many of us, if we're eating eggs, we're not eating pastry. We're not eating things that we shouldn't be eating, and the eggs can make us feel full. They have lots of healthy protein. So I tell everybody six whole eggs a week is fine, and as many egg whites as you want. Now, when you're not sure, what you can do is you can have your cholesterol checked with your doctor. Then you might let yourself have a little more in the way of eggs. Check again. If your cholesterol went really high, eggs are not for you, but for most people, it's going to be fine. Keep a healthy weight. You know that your weight is healthy by checking your body mass index. So I'm 5'6", if I weigh 130, my body mass index is 21. If I weigh 160, my body mass index is 26, and I'm considered overweight. If I weigh 190, then I'm in the obese category. There's a really wide range of healthy weights. So for my height, it's a 30-pound range of healthy weight. And I think it's important to you know, know if your weight is considered healthy for you or not. You may choose to lose 5 or 10 pounds just because you want to. But if your weight is healthy for me, that's OK. And remember that weight, diet, exercise, cholesterol, blood pressure, these are all independent risk factors for heart disease, independent of one another. So if you eat healthier or you exercise more and your weight doesn't change, you're still healthier and at a lower heart risk. Let's talk about exercise. We want to get active. We want to move more. The American Heart Association recommendation is for 150 minutes of moderate aerobic activity per week or 75 of vigorous aerobic activity or a combination of both but every little bit counts. And with the pandemic, it has been very difficult for a lot of people to get adequate exercise. Some people really rely on the gym or they, have a certain, they want to walk outside and that's their exercise. You may have to be flexible about what to do. So I am very into step jacks right now, which are shown with the women on the screen. These are basically jumping jacks, but instead of jumping, you just step to the side because this is low impact. And it's very difficult to argue with your cardiologist when she tells you to do step jacks. Most people can do them. You don't need space. You don't need anything. Do them for two minutes. You'll see. It's tiring. Set a goal for yourself. But you set a realistic goal. So if you're not exercising at all, then please commit today to exercise for 10 minutes. You have 10 minutes. And then try and do it again tomorrow. Keep going. Once you reach your goal, you can ratchet up the intensity a little bit or the time. Walk more. Walking more is always good for you. It adds up. It does not have to be an exercise session. When people say, well, I don't exercise enough, but I walk all around and I'm up and down the stairs constantly, that all counts. Make it a habit and include some muscle strengthening activity like resistance or weight training at least twice a week. This can be with your body weight. You can do wall push-ups. You could do push-ups on the floor. You could do sit-ups, something that increases your muscle tone because that's really healthy for metabolism in the heart. And just get up and move throughout the day as much as you can. Remember that any exercise is better than none. This is from the very large nurses' health study. And if they compared the women who did absolutely nothing to women who walked 10 minutes a day briskly, again, that's not a lot. Heart disease risk goes down by 12% just from that. And as you can see, the more you do, the lower the risk. So just try and do a little more. What about smoking? Every single cigarette you don't smoke lowers your heart attack risk. This is from an international 100,000-plus patient study called InterHeart. You can see that 
Seven to eight cigarettes has a lower risk of heart attack than nine to 10. Nine to 10 has twice the risk of heart attack or stroke over non-smokers. Nicotine replacement is safe and you can use it for a long time. The carton will say six weeks. My patients almost never stick with it for six weeks. I'll tell my patients, you could be on this for six months. You could be on it for two years. Nicotine replacement is safer than smoking. Ultimately, you will want to get off it, but let's first get over the smoking. What about blood pressure? You need to know your numbers. The top number, the systolic, is the pressure when the heart beats. The bottom number, or the diastolic, is the pressure between beats. Normal is less than 120, over less than 80. By the time you're 120 over 80, it's already considered too high. Why? Because studies have now shown that going from being in the 140s to being in the 120s lowers your risk of stroke by 15%. So if you're trained to know that your blood pressure has to be close to 140, and then you say, well, it's 145, that's close enough. It's much better than it used to be. No, it's not close enough because your stroke risk would be 15% lower if your blood pressure were normal. And that's what we're doing all this for, right? We're preventing the risk of heart attack and stroke. How can you manage blood pressure? Eat smart, it may help with blood pressure, especially reducing sodium and processed foods, more activity, managing your weight, not smoking, and getting more sleep because short sleep can raise blood pressure. A little blood pressure lowering goes a really long way, which is why I harp a lot on blood pressure lowering. Studies have shown if you lower blood pressure by 12 for 10 years, you save a life for every 11 patients treated. So work with your doctor to get your blood pressure down to normal. And then as long as you maintain that for 10 years, maybe your life is saved. The target is normal blood pressure. Blood pressure treatment is easy to take. There are many medication op uh, options and they have limited side effects. People who have high blood pressure live longer if they take their medication. If a side effect comes up, just talk to your doctor. There are about 30 different blood pressure pills. You can switch if we have to. But taking medication every single day matters. So you have to tie that medication into something you do every day. There are people who always have that morning coffee. Maybe you take your blood pressure with your coffee. There are people who always brush their teeth before they go to sleep. Maybe you put those pills by the toothbrush. Whatever it is you always do, no matter what, that's when you take your blood pressure medication because you'll remember. What about cholesterol? There are two main types of cholesterol. There's the LDL, which deposits in artery walls, increasing plaque. High levels of LDL or bad cholesterol raise your risk of coronary heart disease and heart attack. Then there's good cholesterol, HDL. That seems to clear cholesterol out of your system and will lower your risk of coronary heart disease. Who should take cholesterol medication? There are four groups. People who already had a heart event or stroke, people whose LDL cholesterol is 190 or higher, People who have diabetes are over 40 and have an LDL that's greater than 70. And anybody who's at an increased 10-year risk. How do you know if you're at an increased 10-year risk? You should know your own numbers. And you can go right to the web, uh, look for the ASCVD Risk Estimator Plus, put your numbers in. You know if you have diabetes or smoke or on blood pressure treatment. And it will spit out for you a 10-year risk of heart attack or stroke. If that risk is 7.5 or greater, you are somebody who should be on cholesterol-lowering drugs, unless there's a specific reason not to treat you. Many people have an intermediate range. They're at 5% or maybe even a 2.5%, but they may have a high lifetime risk because the calculator will tell you that as well. In those cases, additional imaging, like a coronary calcium score, may be useful in trying to tell whether you're somebody who would benefit from cholesterol-lowering medicine now or maybe until you, if you want to wait till later. The target of LDL cholesterol is between 30 and 70. That's normal. Diabetes is important. It raises the risk of heart disease even more in women than it does in men. But medications and lifestyle measures work. So just to get a basic familiarity with the numbers, we're looking at a fasting blood sugar. If it's between 100 and 126, you're considered to have prediabetes. You wanna implement lifestyle changes, diet, exercise. If it's above 126, then you get medication. If you have diabetes, then use medications and diet and exercise to control it. Muscle strengthening exercise can be very important in preventing and treating diabetes because muscles can store blood sugar. Know your numbers and ask your doctor about new medication classes because they not only control diabetes, they also lower cardiovascular risk. You can ask for the GLP-1 agonists or the SGLT-2 inhibitors, even if your A1C is fine. These may lower your risk. And if you can't remember the alphabet soup, it's fine. Doctors know which drugs have recently been shown to reduce risk. Be sure to have your eyes and feet checked regularly and take a statin because they're recommended for nearly all patients with diabetes because they reduce that increased risk. I wanna say a few words about stroke, 
What is a stroke? A stroke happens when blood flow to the brain is interrupted either by a blood clot or by a burst blood vessel causing bleeding. The symptoms are sudden weakness or numbness of the face, arm, or leg, especially on one side of the body, sudden confusion or trouble speaking or understanding, sudden trouble seeing out of one or both eyes, sudden trouble with walking, dizziness, loss of balance or coordination, or sudden severe headache with no known cause. What do you do if you think you might be having a stroke? Call 911. Because if you get to an emergency room, they will first check if you have bleeding or clotting. And if it looks like it's a clotting stroke, there are clot-busting medicines. And if they're given within the first three hours, many people come away with no disability at all. So get help immediately. A quick word about how to talk to your doctor. You're in charge of your health. The doctor is not in charge, you're in charge. So tell the doctor about any symptoms you may be feeling. I think it's helpful to bring a list of questions and write down the answers, or at least bring someone with you who can help you remember what was discussed. I never mind if somebody brings a list of questions. We usually go over them quickly. We make sure all the issues are answered. You need to understand the recommendations of the doctor for medications or tests or whatever. We sometimes forget to use plain language and we use jargon. We don't mean to, but if you don't understand, say so. What else can you do? Please learn CPR, be a good neighbor. Most out of hospital cardiac arrests happen at home, so you might be saving the life of a loved one. Effective bystander CPR provided immediately after an arrest can double the chances of survival for that victim. You don't need to do mouth to mouth. You can only do chest compressions. Those chest compressions move blood around and you can't hurt the person. They're in a very bad way. There's nothing else that's gonna make them worse. You can only make the situation better. So please learn CPR. It's easy to learn, it's easy to do. And if something happens tomorrow and you haven't had a chance to learn CPR, the 911 operator may even be able to tell you how to do chest compression, but please try to learn it before. So what's the most important information for you to take away today? Lead by example. Bring your family with you when you exercise. Eat healthy, eat together. Healthy habits start now. You're a role model, whether you recognize it or not. Tell someone what you learned today. I saw these commercials when I was a little girl. Right? If she tells her friends and then they tell two friends and they tell two friends, then everybody would know that heart disease is preventable and treatable. And at some point, maybe it won't be the leading killer of women. There are simple things that we can do. We can make little steps that improve our health and reduce our heart risk. The most common symptom of heart attack is chest discomfort, but it might not feel that bad and it might not even really be painful. Don't die of doubt. Early treatment of heart attack and stroke saves lives and makes a full recovery more likely. And that's still true, even with the coronavirus pandemic. I know people are worried about going to emergency rooms, but calling 911 is still your best chance of surviving an emergency. Year in and year out, heart disease and stroke are the top two killers worldwide. Fast care is key to survival. ER workers know what to do, even when things seem chaotic. Nobody else is more important. You're really important. And we're very careful to sanitize. Thank you very much for your attention. Wow, Dr. Reynolds, that was a tour de force. I, I, I don't know what to say, but that was an incredible amount of information. Uh, I've already received all sorts of texts and emails saying that was unbelievable. Some people are saying, can I have some of the slides, especially the ones on prevention? Because I think there was so much good information there. So maybe you'll share them. I have a question and I just love the way you answered it already. And I, but I do want to share it because this is how we teach. If one has coronary artery disease, can anything be done with lifestyle to stop it getting worse. And I'm really proud of the fact that you spent half your talk. You're an absolute world expert on women and heart disease and not just women, because most of what you said applies to men as well. Maybe there's some differences in terms of the way women present and the mechanisms, but it's all about treating people and getting people to prevent having heart attacks and strokes. So maybe in one word, cause I've got about five or six questions. The answer to that question is obviously yes. But what do you think are the most important things that we can do? I think one of the saddest things today is that cardiologists and a lot of doctors don't have time. And I know you do, and that's why you're a real doctor. We spend time, no matter what the situation, talking to patients about nutrition, exercise and flexibility, stress management and sleep, because these are the four parts of a stool that ultimately land up making people uh, get into a situation where they're less likely to have heart attacks and stroke. So that's the question. Can lifestyle changes prevent progression of heart disease? You bet, they certainly can. And I think you've shown that. One of, somebody asked you, is it possible to take part in the MBCT study? 
stress study. Uh, and I do, I'm going to give out your phone number here, your, the office number, in case somebody wants to see you or any one of our preventative cardiologists. The number is 212-263-7751. Is that the best way to reach you? Or what if someone wants to be part of the study? Okay, yes, great. that study at the moment, we have just completed enrollment and we're waiting for data analysis, but it's likely that we will open up around two within the next six months or so. So um, you can list yourself on Research Match or you can send a message through clinicaltrials.gov. It's great that you want to participate in research. Everything that we know in cardiology, every treatment that we know works, we know it because of clinical trials. So I love to hear that people want to participate in research. Please go to clinicaltrials.gov, go to Research Match, and you can volunteer for clinical trials, even if we can't put you in this one right this minute. Okay. There's a question from Jackie. Would you recommend a statin for someone who has a low score of 1 to 10 on a coronary calcium score? And maybe you can just quickly tell our audience, what does it mean if your coronary calcium score is abnormal? Coronary calcium, calcium in the heart arteries, it's basically hardening of the arteries. And the calcium will go wherever there's plaque. You can have plaque that doesn't have calcium, but if you have calcium, you have plaque. So the calcium score will give a number of how much calcium there is looking at all the arteries. It's a really fast test, uses very little in the way of x-rays, very helpful in predicting risk. If you, there, for some ages, and really that's maybe up to 65, if you have any plaque, that's not normal. If somebody is 85, then a score of 1 to 10 may be okay. But if you're 40 and your score is 1 to 10, I'm really concerned about that. So it depends a lot on the age. Most people who have any plaque should have cholesterol lowering. Okay. Um, can you put up the questions, Anya? I just want to take a few of these, and then we'll get back to some of the other questions. So what are the signs that in the age of COVID, when there's danger in the ER, that women should go to the ER? And I think you touched on that. I mean, it's so important to go to the ER. It's so important to go to the ER. Wear a mask. Everybody in the emergency rooms gets COVID tested now. They segregate the patients who have positive COVID tests. Heart attack and stroke don't go away just because there's COVID. And we don't want somebody to be missed and have lasting disability. If you get to the hospital early, then it's much better. So the signs and symptoms are the same as they always were. And, and one of the tragedies of, of this COVID situation is that there are a lot of deaths from cardiovascular disease for people that died outside the hospital. Yeah. The actual rate of heart attacks has gone up because people were too scared to come to the hospital and they died outside. So it's absolutely imperative to do exactly what you would have done despite COVID. What are the effects of premenopause on women's heart health? Premenopause is a challenging time for health and that age, it, so it's hard to tease apart how much of it is hormone changes and how much of it is this critical age window because the risk for men goes up around 50 as well. We know this is a time when cholesterol gets higher. Why does cholesterol get higher with age? I don't really understand it, but it does. Why does blood pressure get higher with age? I'm not sure, but I know that in some people, it's practically from one day to the next that their blood pressure may go up and sometimes we can't find the reason. So I chalk it up to aging. But for women with menopause, we know that menopause is part of the concern because women who have their ovaries removed for various reasons are at higher heart risk from the time that they have that interruption of hormones. So it's complicated, like everything. Um, but it does seem to be a time of vulnerability for women. And you want to make sure that you are doing everything you can to know your numbers, know your cholesterol, blood pressure, weight, minutes of exercise. Uh, hemoglobin A1C and, and blood sugar, if I didn't say those, and then make sure that they are where they should be. So this is a huge topic for another day, but when, when women want to know, should they take hormones for this very reason that maybe it will reduce their cardiovascular risk, and it's a decision made with, you know, your gynecologist and many others, what do you do when you get asked that question, just in a nutshell? I don't recommend that women take hormones to reduce cardiovascular risk. In fact, there are studies that show that women who took hormones have been at higher risk of cardiovascular disease. There may be some exclusion if you really slice and dice the data for people who started hormones immediately upon menopause, but I'm not sure how much to make of that. Sometimes people have really intolerable symptoms. They just can't live their lives because of hot flashes. And then I say, take the hormones. You know, you have to live your life. The increase in risk is small, but if I look at the whole population, it's real. So um, it really depends how else you're feeling. You're a whole person, not just a heart. But I don't recommend taking it for heart health. I don't think that works. 
right? And the problem is when someone has a lot of symptoms and you're concerned about the cardiovascular effects. And that's why it's a decision with your doctors. Laurie asked something that you pointed, blood pressure fluctuates all the time. How do you interpret it? Yeah, blood pressure can change from moment to moment. And we all have a range of blood pressure values. It's at its lowest when we're calm and relaxed, and it's at its highest when we're active or upset. And we're bouncing around in that range all day long. So when people are checking blood pressure at home, I'll say, check it a medium part of the day. You don't want to sit there and meditate before you check your blood pressure because it's not realistic. But you also don't want to be running around doing 15 things, sit down, check your blood pressure. Now when you get a high value, it's your exercise blood pressure. That's not what we're looking for. So I want a blood pressure where somebody has been sitting and resting for a while, but it is a real time of the day. You don't only check when you're feeling like everything is going perfectly for you. And that's the kind of blood pressure I use. And as Dr. Goodman knows, we often check blood pressure throughout the day in order to get an average because we think the average blood pressure as you're living your life is probably more important than a single measurement in the office. So there is something called a 24-hour blood pressure monitor, and we often use it because that really helps us to see what's happening over time. Um, there's a question about radiation. What is the effect of left breast radiation on future coronary plaque, coronary artery disease? With current techniques, it should be nil, should be nothing. With older techniques or with radiation uh, directed inside the chest, the risk becomes higher. So for example, people who've had radiation for lymphoma young in life may get coronary disease earlier, but breast radiation should not cause an increased risk of heart disease. Okay. And you know, while we're on that topic, I'd just like to mention that mammograms can show calcium in arteries. It's not the hard arteries they're looking at, but when arteries harden in one place, they tend to harden everywhere. So if your mammogram report says something about arterial calcification, ask your doctor about that. Next slide, Anya. Can insulin cause coronary artery disease? In other words, patients who have type 1 diabetes. Great question. No, insulin does not. And controlling diabetes is extremely important in heart disease prevention. So for patients with type 1 diabetes, you've got to take the insulin in order to control and prevent coronary disease. Okay. A question about LPA. I know we've only got a minute. Should women be checked for this? Is it something that is a significant risk factor that you would, especially women who have events and we can't really explain with other risk factors what's going on? So what's the impact of elevated lipoprotein A in women? Lipoprotein A is a modified cholesterol particle. Everybody has a little of it, but we're very different in the, the modifications, the sort of little doodads that are on your cholesterol particles and make your LPA. Some people have very high levels and have levels that will make them um, at risk, at additional risk for blood clotting. So this is a reason for heart attack and stroke when no other reason can be found, even when traditional cholesterol levels may be low or when there's a strong family history. So when there's a heart event that's otherwise unexplained or when there's a very strong family history, I generally do recommend getting checked for lipoprotein A. Otherwise, routinely, it may not be necessary. And there are a bunch of new drugs that can be directed right at lipoprotein A. Those are in clinical trials. Do you believe that a plant-based diet, diet may be even more superior to Mediterranean diet when we've got all that evidence? Because people often come and ask us, they watch this movie, Forks Overnight. What do you say when someone says, I'll do whatever it takes? Yeah, that is a tough question. And I know that I'm partially biased by being somebody who really enjoys animal protein. I think fish is helpful. Studies show that fish is helpful. So a pescatarian diet is probably, in my opinion, the best, but I can't deny that there's research out there saying plant-based is better, and, and I am not sure. If you're willing to do it, it's probably the best, but be careful because you can have vegan cookies, you can have only plant-based cookies, and they can still be really bad for you. So um, it's most important to have a healthy balance of nutrients. Okay. I just want you to repeat one more time. There's a whole lot of people who are interested in coming to volunteer for research. So what, where do they go with you to repeat those sites for them? Absolutely. Look for Research Match. Research Match lets you put in some information about yourself and will match you up with research studies that are recruiting. You can look at clinicaltrials.gov. If you've been given any diagnosis from A to Z, look for research studies that are uh, related to that diagnosis, and you may be able to volunteer. And the other thing is uh, the American Heart Association's research goes red. So you can sign yourself up, and they will connect uh, you and inf get information about you just through your phone. It's very low touch. And as research studies come up, they are offered to you. So that's in line with the menopause question because I'm one of the investigators of a research goes red weight study. 
and we're looking at um, factors that influence weight change through the menopausal transition. So research goes red, research match, and clinicaltrials.gov. And don't forget, we're both wearing some red today because we're focusing on women and heart disease, but we're interested in preventing heart disease for both sexes. We spend a lot of time and energy trying to get the word out about women and heart disease. And Harmony, you're an absolute rock star. It's a privilege to have you on, in our series and to be part of the NYU and the prevention program. So I wanna thank you so much on behalf of everybody for coming to talk to us. A lot of you have sent in questions, personal questions about aortic stenosis, regurgitation, arrhythmias. Here's the number to call our, our, our department, 212-263-7751. You can make an appointment to see Dr. Reynolds. She's very busy. It might take a while, but there's several cardiologists who will be happy to see you, and we will spend a lot of time talking to you about prevention. Thank you so much. Thanks to Anya, and thank you, everybody, for listening. Please don't forget to contact us at hearthealth at nyulangone.org. We'll tell you about future programs, and we look forward to seeing you again for our nutrition program on March 31st. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much.